poetess Stevie Smith said, I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. This album recognises that feeling, but is ultimately more optimistic. Spend the next few moments with me and Rupert Hine, creator of last year's debut album for a and Records, Immunity. He has returned this year with his lyricist, Jeanette Hobster, and together they are waving, not drowning. a compliment to it and there's only so much you can do on one album I think I see both Immunity and Waving Not Drowning as being very much a collection of one series of ideas if you like they re- both albums represent episode one of a sequence of ideas musically I think the biggest difference with this album is that the rhythmical side has become more immediate more forceful more attacking that rhythm box doesn't sound very aggressive. No, no, it's the basic backbone of the first track, Eleven Faces, but you have to start somewhere. So what do you do with it now? Well, you process it. Do you use any real drum sounds? They use real drum sounds, but in a sense they're recorded in an unreal way. I'll go into the studio and record a nice ambient snare drum, say. I need only play it a couple of times and trap it in a digital device in the studio, which is like a digital recorder, just traps a very small portion of sound. Once it's in that, I can hit one button in the control room and it'll retrieve and play that sound. I can obviously also do the same for the bass drum. If you put all these component parts together, then hopefully you'll come up with a rhythm that'll tie together and form the basis for a song like Eleven Faces. Why Eleven Faces? Well, it's the ultimate test of memory as experienced through the witness to an identity parade based on the thought, how much can we trust what we think we remember? The man concerned uses a deeper kind of perception to be sure. Indirectly question the system by implication that the memory can fail the test. Explain the term processed sound well it covers a multitude of sins it really is a a term that broadly suggests all the treatments that you can do to sound now that in in itself has taken over from the playing of instruments to a certain degree by that i mean that rather than sitting there thinking am i going to play this particular melodic line or this melody on a keyboard or guitar which is the kind of limited choice that we've tended to get used to in the last 20 years of rock and roll music we can now look at a much broader spectrum. We can say, well, let's go out and record a, the sound of a seagull and find a note in it and then connect that up to a keyboard and play it. In the case of the song The Curious Kind, we were looking for a sound that would have the right kind of thickness and wodginess uh, to back up the melody behind the voice. And I thought, well, let's actually start with the voices, but we'll, we'll end up playing them on a keyboard. So what we need to do is record a series of voices all holding one note and then we feed them through a series of gadgets. The original voices sounded something like this. Once we've got just that one note held in these gadgets, we can then pass them through and eventually the sound ends up being controlled by an ordinary keyboard. The keyboard itself is making no sound, it's simply controlling the pitch of those voices. (laughs) 
So is there a place for real instruments in your music? Most certainly, without real instruments, recognisable instruments like electric guitars, uh, you don't have any contrast for the process sounds. There's nothing for them to shine out against. You need that balance. I would say particularly the acoustic piano is an instrument that's very much at the forefront through most of my songs. Of course, there's nothing to stop you recording it in different ways, and on the curious kind, there's a particular treatment that's a favourite of ours. So where do all these ideas stem from? Well, over the last few years, both Steve and Taylor, my engineering partner and myself, have worked on many, many albums, either as producers or engineers. Uh, and occasionally you're working on an album where you can really push, if you like, certain forefronts and get away from the idea of just recording a sound accurately. And you can start thinking about what you can do with it once it's uh, coming up through a mixing console. Um, just such an album three or four years ago was Café Jacques' Round the Back album, which I produced and is still one of my favourite albums. Uh, Christopher Thompson was the lead vocalist in that band, and he's joining me on the song The Curious Kind. So who are the curious kind? We're all the curious kind when we're born. The natural instincts of man include curiosity, which in childhood explores the world through innocent but searching eyes develops in the adult, especially those in science, with sometimes devastating and permanent repercussions. Will we unravel the mysteries of our universe to our cost? Waving not drowning by Rupert Hein. You've already mentioned Café Jacques as a production. You've produced quite a few albums over the last few years. Do you have any personal favourites? It's always a difficult one. I was fortunate enough in the first year or two that I started producing, straight after my second solo album in 1973, to work with two artists who gave me a lot of freedom in terms of trying to get to grips with what we could do with sound. The first was Yvonne Elliman, who in 1973-4, when I did the Food or Love album with her, was mainly known for being Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, she asked me originally to write the songs, and having worked with her on the songs over a couple of months, she also asked me to produce it, so it was my first strictly outside production. In working with musicians like Peter Townsend and Michael Giles, late of King Crimson at that time. I knew that the people around me were going to make the most of any ideas that I had that were maybe a little off the wall or original, hopefully original. Uh, shortly afterwards, or within a year of that album, I did an album with Kevin Ayers called The Confessions of Dr. Dream. And Kevin, much like myself, I think is interested in always trying to find new ways of doing things. And uh, on that album, we started working very much with tape loops and all kinds of beginnings of processed sound ideas uh, given the equipment was not nearly as advanced obviously as it is now but uh, given those restrictions I think a, a lot of interesting ideas came out of that album and ever since then I've tried to work with people that would give me the space and the room to make the most of their ideas but with my own injection of sound since then, having worked with people like Anthony Phillips, uh, who was the ex-Genesis guitarist, I did two solo albums with him some four or five years ago. Uh, he also worked with me very much on a collaborative level, and bands like Camel. More recently, The Fix, the group that I just finished an album with, and I've got great hopes for them, much like Café Jacques, they're an original band with a very, very strong lead voice an excellent arrangement so there's, there's been a few favourites over the period of time This track we're hearing in the background I recognise as being part of this setup. is that right? 
It is a part of the setup. It was one that was played down in the final mix, i.e. this is very much the rhythmical side of the track, which we felt in the end should just be a quiet underlaying of the tune. Just who is being set up? Well, we're all set up by somebody or other, or some body of people or other. Really, the song traces the cycle of normal conditioning into society. If we notice the process, the effects may not entirely obscure individual potential. Square peg, round hole. Never mind, they're bringing the heat and we're plastic. Hole in one, that's how it's done. So how did the idea for Dark Windows and the Thunderstorm start or emerge? Well, I was actually sitting down with Stephen in the control room, just the two of us, thinking about what would be the right atmosphere for the song. I was explaining it in terms of Samsara on the last Immunity album, in that it needed to be a natural sound, a sound that people would recognise, and yet I had to have some kind of ominous and slightly foreboding quality for the idea of the song. As we talked, flashes appeared in the room. At first we thought it was some technical fault. Maybe the console was about to explode on us. We gradually realised it was a thunderstorm. We turned to face the window, decided that it was well worth getting into. So we turned the lights out, pulled up our chairs to the window, stuck some microphones out of the window and monitored the sound of the thunderstorm through the studio loudspeakers. And 1,600 watts of thunderstorm, which is a fairly strong experience. We were there for about an hour, enjoying the spectacle. It was two or three in the morning, so the night time, the lightning looked quite incredible. It was only after the thunderstorm died away that we turned to each other and realised that this was the absolute atmosphere we were looking for. All we needed to do was to think of it in a rhythmical sense, and by injecting rhythm into it. Thus was born, if you like, the rhythm track for Dark Windows. Dark Windows as a title, does this refer to windows in darkness or maybe glazed windows? It's much more like the idea of the black windows you'd see on a Cadillac. It's really a lament, ah, who would be a hero? Being struck down becomes synonymous with heroism. How many American kids are still longing to be president? The song is for John Lennon, Sadat, the Pope, Martin Luther King, or even even Reagan. A man in power now forgets his personal freedom. He pays his human shield on time, lest one betray him. One day it happens, just as he always knew it would. So what are your musical influences, or should I say who are you influenced by musically? I am really not sure anymore. Maybe ten years ago one was influenced by certain American kinds of music. I think this is certainly not true now. I think we're beyond the state of being influenced by America. It is itself beyond the state of influencing, mainly because it's not advancing at all. America has ceased to be in musical terms. It's just stuck five years ago in a digital trap. I think, if anything, the influences probably come from England or Europe now, if there are any. I'm not aware of it, but I suppose through having respect for certain artists, um, maybe something of their music comes out or gives you the odd pointer from time to time. In terms of those artists, and I have great respect for people like David Bye and Peter Gabriel. Uh, America perhaps has one sole survivor at the moment, and I think David Byrne and Talking Heads are almost solely responsible for waving the American flag at the moment. You obviously feel strongly about uh, the state of the American music industry. Well, I do, because, purely because it, it really does uh, affect so much of the world record industry. It still represents 50% of the entire world record market. 
That means that it has the controlling vote, if you like, in terms of the way that the record industry moves. We can see in England that in just the last few years, English radio has, particularly the last year, has gone even more towards the American very, very safe, very middle-of-the-road approach and the whole refreshing new wave of four or five years ago that had uh, so much airplay for a while has given way once again to very safe ironing board music. Housewife quietly humming, it's back to just being wallpaper stuff. Uh, and I feel America's influence is very much to blame here. I think we're looking towards Europe now and newer countries for rock music like Australia to actually liven everything up. Perhaps the greatest influences are not really musical ones, they're just the topical events around us. Uh, one gets all kinds of ideas, uh, all the topics and conviction that we have behind the songs stems from the way we feel about what's happening around us. And it often suggests both musical and obviously especially lyrical ideas in the first place. One, I, d I don't honestly feel aware of being influenced particularly by anybody. We're listening to a segment of The Sniper. The Sniper is very much a song of today, unfortunately. Uh, it reflects really what's happened in the last year or so. It follows on very logically from Dark Windows on the album, which is suggesting the idea of the danger of being a public figure. One of the main dangers, obviously, being the sniper in all his forms. I should say that on the day I started recording this track, Ron Reagan got shot, and the day we finished mixing this track, the Pope got shot. At that point, I thought maybe I'd had enough of the sniper. Jeffrey Richardson and Phil Palmer play on this track. Viola and guitar, I believe. Yes, they play in the, the body of the song, and they also play on the solos at the end. I too felt it was time to have a go at putting a solo down on one of the tracks. I used the sound of a, a scream, something like a baby. Or maybe it was an old man, but it was processed anyway. If you believe in God, maybe this is him. This is his random death hymn. If you don't fight for the right to live, you might just die, something we're all sure to do in the end. If you believe in human error, perhaps he is its patron saint, calm, cool and efficient. One of his decisions remains a mystery. Waving, not drowning, by Rupert Hyde. You're listening to Waving Not Drowning by Rupert Hine. Side 2, Innocence in Paradise. Phil Collins, I believe, plays the drums and percussion on this track. Well, not strictly true. Uh, the drums I played myself, courtesy of the digital methods we were talking about in relation to Eleven Faces. Phil plays the mad toms and things you can hear at the moment in a, a rather digital way that might be a bit complex to explain. What did he first work with Phil? He played on the Immunity album as well. That's right. I met Phil four or five years ago um, when Brand X and Quantum Jump were working somewhat side by side. There were a few mutual members who had been working together. And uh, around that time, Phil played on the Café Jacques albums that I produced. Uh, and after that, tended to play on a, a few productions, mainly percussion. He also played on the Camel album I produced in 78, 79. Who are the Innocents in Paradise? In a way, they're the wild uncontrollable, rebellious youth. I mean, I think this song is 
another reflection of the fact that the songs on this album are much more topical uh, than on Immunity. I mean, they're, they're intentionally very much reflecting what's happening around us. This song in particular uh, reflects the state of affairs in England from last summer, so the summer of 81. Uh, it's a song of liberty, a song for England to remind her of the extra powers given to the law in order to curb the rioting of summer 81. So far, already from the Garden of Eden, where only nature's laws applied, will we, in our frustrations, provoke the law to a stranglehold. The young are vulnerable to political manipulation and should wake up to this fact. We are always playing into the hands of some invisible system. I gather you do an extensive... uh mega tour, a worldwide tour of a small portion of Europe last year. Was it a success? Very much so, yeah. Uh, It was there really to prove for myself, and I suppose to the people who were putting up the money for it, that we could actually convert the kind of music I've been doing on these albums into a a live performing version. Uh, Of this I think we did. You play almost everything on the albums yourself. Presumably this is not true of the live performance. Yes, it isn't true. No, in fact, I do the complete opposite. Uh, on the live performance, I just sing. And I have a sturdy team of four other musicians who manage between them, somehow or other, to, to play everything else. Uh, there's Trevor Morais on drums and percussion, who plays on some of the tracks on the album. And... Peter Veach, who used to be with Café Jacques, keyboard player and one of the main two writers in that band, is one of the two keyboard players. The other is a a newcomer, Rab Handley. And on the front line, as it were, along with me, is a fellow called Geoffrey Richardson. Now, he used to play with you in Quantum Jump, if I'm correct, and also in the group Caravan, was it? Good spotting, yes, he did. He even played with uh, Café Jacques at one point. In fact, we can ask him ourselves, as he just happens to be in the building. Is that him sitting next to you? Yes. Geoffrey, uh, would you like to just join us for a few minutes? How long have you known this particular fellow? I met Rupert ten years ago. I was in the studio with Caravan, as you mentioned. Uh, We were recording a little track called Hoedown, a 7-8 country ditty. I looked round and there was Rupert making very strange noises on an ARP synthesizer. No, he wasn't in the group at the time, I believe. Somehow, he just appeared. I'm not quite sure how. So where did this particular meeting take you? What happened next? Well, in the ten years to come, I found myself playing lots of instruments on lots of sessions, uh, with Rupert producing. And uh, now I find myself a member of the live group of Rupert's. Um, I play guitar, clarinet, uh, bass and viola. We find that we have to uh, we have the opportunity to change the arrangements of some of the songs from the album versions to a live version. For instance, Dark Windows. Um, We discover that nearly all of the group play a stringed instrument and we pick them up and, do, and worked a little string arrangement out for Dark Windows rather than using the tape sounds from the album. This is as opposed to using a string synthesizer? Well yes, it's, it's very effective actually to suddenly change from whatever we were playing, pick up stringed instruments and uh, frankly bemuse the audience by suddenly becoming a string section. I have heard that the group have a identikit image wearing white coats or something. Maybe you could tell us a bit about the way the band looks. Well, we find ourselves being very white when we're with Rupert. How Uh, true, how true. Very uh, medical, quite mechanical. Yes, Uh, they even sprout white hair, especially for the occasion. Yes, very hard to do, particularly in Peter's case. I'm sorry, Peter. (laughs) Yes, there's a certain lack of hair in certain places, but in other places there's a lot, so there's no real problem. Good heavens. It swings and roundabouts. Really, swings and roundabouts. Yeah. Oh, look, could I change the attitude here a little? Now, 
on the last tour in the summer, were you already performing numbers from the new album? You've mentioned Dark Windows. Were there any other songs that you performed on that tour? Yes, uh, we played Dark Windows, The Sniper, and um, House Arrest. Um, in fact, we found that we were performing the songs m much at the same time as, Ru as Rupert was writing and recording them, uh, which was quite unusual. Um, in the case of House Arrest, it was so new to us, we found enormous difficulties picking up the, the beat, the important beat in the drum intro. Is that the pattern that we can hear in the background? It is. It sounds uh, deceptively simple, but on a darkened stage, uh, creeping on quietly and trying to pick up a downbeat was very strange indeed. That's right. It was the first number in the set, in fact. Uh, anyway, you, hopefully you'll hear the number in a minute. Then you can see for yourself where it all falls. I mean, the song is actually dedicated to Donald Woods, who, as you may know, was a cohort of Steve Beaker in South Africa and was put under house arrest because of his association with, with Beaker and was eventually forced out of the country and now lives in England. House arrest. We've talked about using drum machines and rhythm boxes as a triggering device for other sounds and synthesizers. Do you ever use the drum machine for a drum sound in itself? I do, but not as a straight drum machine sound, as in a lot of the electronic bands that are about now. I find that sound a bit too dull. It tends to be very small. If you can feed that sound out through loudspeakers into a large room or a hall, and re-record it back onto tape, you get a very nice, natural, roomy sound. Does it have to be programmed into the drum machine? The drum machine we use has a button which you can hit. You can just put the sound onto snare drum, hit the button, and you'll get the sound of a snare drum, which means, in effect, you're playing it live. What does it sound like? Pretty much like this. And the bass drum? the Immunity and Waving Not Drowning albums, you have created some fairly strange vocal effects. Do you have any favorites? We can take two examples here of explorations in vocal effects. One would be Make a Wish on the Immunity album, and also The Outsider on Waving Not Drowning. Within Make a Wish, the idea was, fairly simply, to create two voices. One represents a computer, the robot, the robot voice that's left on planet Earth after the bomb has dropped. The other voice had to represent the vegetable, the mutant, the subhumanoid, that was left needing to be re-educated. The robotic voice was obviously no problem. A negative perspiration situation room. But the other voice was certainly a lot trickier. We recorded the voice straight onto a piece of tape, turned the tape round, heard what it sounded like backwards, relearned the sound of those words, and then on a fresh piece of tape recorded those sounds and turned that piece of tape backwards. The example I can give you is if I say one, two, three, four, turn the tape over, it will sound like uf, irf, ut, na. And if I copy that, as indeed I just have, record that sound and turn it back the other way, it should sound close to one, two, three, four. In fact, it'll sound slightly more like one, two, three, four. It'll never sound quite the same. So this is a part of Make a Wish. Correction. It wasn't actually used on the final track. We felt it may have been a little confusing. Let's face it, it's just taken me almost two minutes to explain the idea. However, it does represent a good demonstration of vocal effects. Right. A flash. A flash. Reflected. Reflected. In her eye. What would you say? How? Oh. We say. Goodbye. Goodbye. In 
the height of the day. It would have been the end of more than you and me. Raving Not Drowning by Rupert Hine. Your music has been accused of being disturbing. Would you agree? I think the job that music has in our lives is very varied. Uh, I think the record industry has promoted music very much as an entertainment over the last few years, and that's one valuable attribute, but it certainly is capable of being one of the most communicative mediums of all the art forms. I mean, I think it's on parallel with film as far as getting across much greater and perhaps more important ideas. Make a Wish was dealing with the ultimate threat of nuclear war, and let's face it, that has to be a disturbing idea. You mentioned earlier the outsider in the context of vocal treatments. Is this also intended to be uncomfortable? Slightly more claustrophobic, and I suppose claustrophobia is uncomfortable, but uh, the song is situated much more within the idea of somebody being at the wrong place, at the wrong time, and overhearing things they're not intended to hear. Perhaps the other most notable facet of the outsider is the orchestral sounds you've used. I assume there's probably not a real player amongst them. Is this true? Well, as a player of keyboards, they're actually mainly made up from uh, various digital synthesizers, which I found to be particularly good at emulating orchestral sounds. Not something I was particularly involved with on the first album. I just felt that uh, we needed, within this idea, to have a very rich and almost genuine sounding orchestral arrangement. Uh, the primary instrument was the New England Digital Synclavier II synthesizer, which was very, very good at working within the very restricted confines of natural string sounds, complete with bow scrapes and attention to detail that string synthesizers or previous analog synthesizers haven't been capable of doing. The orchestral sounds on the track are, are used in a way that's supposed to convey familiarity with instruments that you recognise, set against the very impressionistic quality of the verse and the voices. The voices really are, are as if they're heard through the wall of a hotel, any hotel, in a strange city. The voices, if you can decipher them, build a story. Meanwhile, silently, in the next room, the innocent bystander witnesses the spider weaving his web upon the wall and the fly stumbling into the trap helplessly caught. As is the victim in the adjacent room, struggling with his conscience. The witness is too late to be effective. Who is the wrong man? Waving Not Drowning by Rupert Hine. Sometimes it's more useful to create rhythms from very familiar sounds. Such as? A Psycho Surrender take on the Immunity album. We, we used very familiar pots, pans, all kind of domestic sounds that to me represented home tedium. And in putting them together to make up a rhythm pattern... I was hoping it would highlight the sense of boredom. The song about boredom is really just to highlight the fact that perhaps the greatest threat to human endeavour is apathy. The more aware we are of becoming apathetic, hopefully the more adventurous we will stay. Why 
said, do you not write your own lyrics? Or indeed, do you? The answer to that is no. I think people should do what they're best at. I feel very much at home working with music and the extraordinary potential in the emotional strength that music can achieve. It's a rather abstract medium when you think about it, but obviously the more you work within it, the less abstract it becomes, the more controllable it becomes. I find when I'm actually needing to be specific and turn it into plain English, that as soon as one actually achieves that moment where you feel you're actually making the point, it seems to become less poetic. Again, it's one of those things that I'm sure if one worked at, as hard in that area, then I might feel less reticent to express myself in words. But my association with Jeanette Obstoy is such that she has very much devoted a large part of her life so far to expressing herself through the written word. And one man's poison. It's really a question of acknowledging people's prejudices. One should always try and understand the other's view. It's like playing devil's advocate with yourself which is strangely what I've been doing for the last few moments. Exactly. I think as you look through the catalogue of one man's meats being other men's poison, you start to understand and hopefully retain an understanding of what makes people different and why it is so very necessary to have these differences of opinion. We must always remember never to be genuinely, to be inwardly prejudiced. There is no point in papering the world's airwaves with musical waste. If we are to commit ourselves within music and words, we have a responsibility to think before we speak and believe in what we say. <laughs> 